This video was sponsored by FlexiSpot. Almost any major programming language has a tool you can use to cast strings to numbers. But if your preferred programming language didn't offer this tool right out of the box, would you be able to convert the string into a number by yourself? Today we are going to learn how this process works. The first thing I want to talk about today is data. As you know, computers can only process and remember ones and zeros. In other words, they can only handle numbers. A computer cannot understand what a character or a color is. So when we need them to remember this kind of non-numeric information, our only option is to start encoding that data in the form of numbers. Take, for example, the ASCII table. If we want to remember the word hello, we can't store characters in memory. Again, that's not how computers work. But what we can do is associate each possible character with a specific binary number and store that value instead. In our example, the word hello in lowercase would look like this in memory. For simplicity, we will stick with ASCII for this video. But keep in mind that modern computers use a different encoding called Unicode, which is a superset of ASCII. I'll make a video about this in the future, so consider subscribing. You don't want to miss it. Now let's talk a bit about what happens when the user inputs data using the keyboard. The easiest way to think about this is that every time a button is pressed, the ASCII code of the character associated with the button is stored in a buffer. When we write programs that require the user to provide information, our programs generally receive the information stored in this buffer. This means that even if the input information is numeric, our program is actually receiving plain text containing the digits of a number. This is where things start to confuse some people. To put it in perspective, let's consider a simple program that asks the user for two numbers. Once provided, the program returns the result of adding those numbers. Since the two numbers are provided as characters, we can't just add the bits stored in the buffer because they are not the real numbers we want to add. And don't get me wrong, since this data stored in memory is still ones and zeros, the computer could indeed add those values. But those bits are meant to represent characters 5 and 3, not the numbers 5 and 3. So adding them would result in adding the number that encodes the character 5, which is 53, and the number that encodes the character 3, which is 51, resulting in a total of 104, an incorrect result. In other words, it's our job to transform that information into the number the user is trying to express with those characters. This gets even more complicated when we deal with multi-digit numbers. Converting each character into the corresponding binary number it represents doesn't mean that, side by side in memory, those bits will represent the intended number. And apparently this doesn't let some people sleep, especially beginners. There must be a process to correctly convert a string into a number. Any decent programming language has some tool to do this either in its standard library as in C, or as a built-in function of the language as in Python. But on this channel, we hate black boxes. Our purpose today is to understand how these functions work under the hood. Hi friends, my name is George, and this is Core Dumped. Today's video was sponsored by FlexiSpot. One thing we share as developers is having to deal with long routines sitting in front of a computer. Today, FlexiSpot is promoting their OC6 Mesh Ergonomic Chair, which has great lumbar support crafted to embrace your body's natural curves, promoting optimal posture and eliminating the risk of back strain. Not only that, but the chair itself is very customizable. You can adjust the seat height, the armrests, the seat depth, and many other features like the head support and the back angle. So, whether you want to concentrate during your long work sessions or just enjoy your favorite content, you can do it in a comfortable and healthy way. If you are interested, you can check out this and many other great FlexiSpot products using the link in the description below. Our goal today is to learn how to convert a decimal number formatted as a string into a number that the computer can use to perform operations. The first thing we should notice is that in the ASCII table, all 10 numeric characters are not only grouped together, but also ordered. This is not a coincidence. There are multiple reasons for this design, but let's focus on our specific problem. Notice that the first numeric character, which is 0, is encoded using the binary number 00110000, which is 48 in decimal. Since all numeric characters are grouped and ordered, we could say that each numeric character has been codified adding 48 to the actual number it represents. In other words, we can convert any numeric character to the number it represents, 
by simply subtracting 48 from the number that encodes it. Before continuing, let me clarify something. In low-level languages like C, when we use characters in numeric operations, what we are actually telling the computer is to use the number that encodes that character as an operand. For example, when we subtract 48 from the character 2, we are actually subtracting 48 from the number that encodes character 2, which is 50. 50 minus 48 is 2, and this is how we obtain the number the character represents, which is exactly what I just explained with the ASCII table. Depending on the programming language you use, you might have to take extra steps. For example, in Python, you need to use the ORD function to get the number that encodes a character. Also, because we are good programmers, we don't want to hard code the number 48, but rather use whatever number encodes the first numeric character, which is zero. Okay, but what about multi-digit numbers? We already know that simply converting each digit into its corresponding binary number is not enough because the concatenated sequence of bits corresponds to a different decimal number. The good news is that converting each digit is part of the process, so we are already halfway through it. Before showing you the algorithm, let's remember something. When we write a decimal number like this one, what we are expressing is an amount, which is the result of adding seven units, two tens, three hundreds, and four thousands. If we know how to convert each character to the number it represents, a computer can use these numbers to follow the same procedure. The rightmost digit is multiplied by 10 to the power of zero, which is one. The digit one position to the left is multiplied by 10 to the power of one, the next one by 10 to the power of two, and the next one by 10 to the power of three. Once these multiplications are solved, we can add those numbers to obtain the number we are looking for. And basically, that is everything we need to do to convert a string into a number. Obviously, the process looks easy when animated. A computer doesn't do it all at once, but rather sequentially, step by step. These are the C and Python versions of the algorithm to achieve this, and don't worry, I'll animate an example so you can understand. A string is an array of characters. Since we need to convert every digit to a number, we need to iterate over this array. And since we have to multiply and then add these numbers, we'll need a variable to accumulate the result. Just so you can follow along, I'll show the whole process in both binary and decimal. But keep in mind that the binary version is what actually happens on a computer. We start iterating and find the character 4. The first thing we need to do is get the number that character represents. For this, we subtract 48 from the number that encodes the character. So far, nothing new. We already know how this works. Now we should multiply this number by a power of 10 and then add the result to our variable, but at this point, we don't know what power to use because we don't know how many digits follow. This might sound counterintuitive because we could just get the length of the string, but here's the thing. Depending on the programming language we are using, getting the length could have different time complexities. In some programming languages, strings are objects or structs, and in others are just arrays of characters. And we don't want to worry about this now, so we'll take a different approach. What we are going to do instead is to add this value to our variable so we can remember it for future iterations. When we get to the next character, we do the same thing. We get the number that character represents, in this case, 3. And now that we have gotten two numbers from the string, we can start adding. But we can't just add 4 and 3 because the digit 4 is one position to the left, which means it should be one order of magnitude above the number 3. Hence, we multiply the value in the variable, which right now is 4, by 10. This causes the number to shift one position to the left, transforming the number 4 into 40. Now we can add 40 plus 3 equals 43. And this is what we are going to remember for the next iteration. We get to the next character, and again, we calculate the number that character represents. Then we get the value in the variable, so we can add the current number to the total. But once again, before adding, we need to multiply the value in the variable by 10, so we can shift everything one position to the left. If you think about it, what we are doing here is actually multiplying the previous number, which is 3, by 10, but also multiplying by 10 one more time the number before the previous number, which is 4. And this is why we don't really need to know the length of the string. As we keep going, we are multiplying each digit by 10 as many times as needed. 430 plus 2 is 432. We update the total in our variable and keep doing the same for each character that follows in the string. 
In our example, the next character is 7. We get the number the character represents, retrieve the number in our variable, and multiply it by 10 to shift everything one position to the left. Then we add that number to our current digit, which results in 4,327, and update the variable with this value. Since there are no more characters in the string, the current value accumulated in our variable is the number we've been looking for. And just like that, we've converted a decimal number formatted as a string into a number. In this example, our number requires two bytes in memory. These are the same function in two different programming languages, and they do exactly what we just learned. The function receives a string, uses a variable to accumulate the result, and iterates through each character in the received string. For each character, it calculates the number it represents and adds it to 10 times the amount accumulated in the result variable in previous iterations. When no more digits are left, it returns the value in the result variable. Now, if we want to make this function more robust, we should check that the characters in the string are all numeric. Otherwise, it should return some sort of error. In C, we usually return negative 1 since errors per se don't exist in C. Before ending this video, I want you to think about this. When we use computers to perform calculations, we usually want to print the result back. But the result stored in memory is a binary number, which is hard for us to understand. So we print it as a decimal number formatted as a string. To do this, we typically pass the number to the print function, which automatically formats it as a string. This means there must be an inner process to obtain the ASCII code of each character that makes up that number when represented as a decimal number. It's like the opposite process of what we've learned today. If you want me to explain that process in a future episode, let me know in the comments. Let's wrap things up for now. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button. It is free, and that would help me a lot. And if you want to learn more, don't forget to subscribe. I'm already working on more cool videos, so you don't want to miss them. See you in the next one.